Hello there, it's Phil Crowshaw again from Passions and in this episode we welcome Ian Freeman to the show to talk entertainment. Enjoy. Hello and a very warm welcome to this edition of Passions and today I'm delighted to be joined by Ian Freeman uh, and Ian, Ian's going to talk to, me about, talk to me about his passions and some of his experiences and career highlights over the years. So a very warm welcome to Passions Ian. Thank you very much Phil, it's great to be here, thank you for having me. Fantastic, you're very welcome. Okay Ian, well, let's, let's start where it always starts with tell us who you are and what you do and what your passion is. Right. Well, my name's Ian Freeman. I'm retired now, but I've had a, a sort of a plural career, as it's known these days, in the entertainment business. Um, starting, I, I started off when I was uh, when I left school and went into my family's um, theatrical agency. My family, uh, my mother's brothers were uh, Lord Delphont, Lord Grade. Uh, so we were sort of imbued in show business, even though my dad was a GP. I had a choice of show business or medicine, and um, I chose show business. Um, I then carried on through my career uh, as an agent, then uh, into the film business, where I went into marketing for Paramount uh, Universal Pictures uh, here in England. And I then went to EMI Films, then to a company called First Leisure Corporation, which was out, out of home leisure. So nightclubs, bars, restaurants. And I've always been connected with, for obvious reasons, I've always been connected with the entertainment industry. And that, oddly enough, Phil, is my passion, show business. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, great. So, you know, you should have gone show business when you did that. Show business. Gla uh, yeah, jazz hands. Well, I have to say, um, in all honesty, what a distinguished career. Um, not to mention of obviously very, what you might call, um, uh, what you might call high level theatrical stock, I suppose. Yeah. In, in show business stock. The trouble is that no one under 50 has, has heard of um, Lou Grade whose picture is up there, or Bernard Delfont anymore, or Leslie Grade, my other uncle who started the agency. Um, it's it's odd because they were like the the, the scions, the icons of, of, of the entertainment business in the 50s, 60s, 70s. But nowadays, of course, um, we have Simon Cowell and we have other people doing similar things. So it's, it's a bit different. Every, everything moves on, doesn't it? Well, yeah, the good course. news is... Should. It should, yeah. And the good news is that because I'm over 50, I know exactly who Lou is. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> so you've no problems there at all. I'm uh, glad funnily to enough, hear it. I have the same problems. I've interviewed a lot of people over the years, and I, I had a business TV channel back in the uh, in the early noughties on, on, on the internet. And I used to interview some pretty high profile, well known people of the time. But when I sometimes do speeches at conferences and events and I talk about some of these people that I was fortunate enough to interview, it's the same thing. You know, a certain age group in there are going, That's who? right. Who? Yeah. Who? And yet at the time they were they were major players. There is though a move back, I think, now to uh, the older style of entertainment, particularly if you look at comedy um, yeah. and sort of slapstick and uh, and sort of typical British comedy. If you look at stuff like Mrs. Brown's Boys, which is very popular and going back um, uh, to things like Benidorm recently, that's a sort of a revival, if you like, of the older style of comedy. Whilst I'm a huge fan of all comedy and I'm, I'm a big fan of, of the newer, younger comedians, I think there's always going to be a place for that sort of slightly slapstick style, uh, which is introducing itself to a whole new audience now. People who have maybe never heard of Norman Wisdom or, uh, or any of those people. 
Well, yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I, I get wonderful nostalgic feelings of uh, of watching some of the old movies uh, as people would see them, the old movies, uh, you know, yeah. and like you say, Norman Wisdom and those sorts of people, Abbott and Costello and, you know, Malcolm and Wise and all those people. Sure. Like you, I grew up, grew up very, very much with those people and, uh, and they still make me laugh now. It's... <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're making everyone laugh and people are new people are, and younger people are discovering them every day you know the two ronnie's standing absolutely Baxter. yeah do you, do you think i mean you've obviously been in and around it and around the block 10 times over you've seen the changes in i guess what's acceptable and not acceptable you know what is now debated as the woke society debated as the politically correct society What's your feelings on that? Do you think it's gone too far or do you think it was inevitable it was always going to get reeled in a bit? It's a good question, Phil. And I think it was inevitable that it was going to get reeled in a bit. And I'm one of the people, few people of my age, I'm 70, and I'm one of the few people of my age that actually thinks that things are going the right way now. Um, things were of their time. I mean, if you look back to TV shows like Love Thy Neighbour and Mind Your Language and even on the buses and stuff like that, um, you'll find that things were of their time. At the time when they were produced and when they were popular, they were perfectly acceptable. These days, times have changed, things are different, and they're no longer acceptable. And I quite understand that, I have to say. Uh, I might be in a minority of people of my age who are always calling out for the old style variety and everything to come back. I'm a big fan of old style variety, but I'm also a big fan of, of new style entertainment. And um, like with everything else, as we said earlier, things move on. Yeah, they do, especially this last 12 months moved on in a way that none of us could have ever even started Absolutely. to imagine with the COVID yeah. situation, of course. Yeah. So um, you obviously you, you say that you, you, your dad was a GP, I think you said, and then, of course, you've got their non-calls and what have you, like the, the, the stature of, of Lou Gray. How yeah. did you get involved then? Why, how come you didn't become Doc like dad? And what, well, what drove you over that side to that side like, of the family? Like every uh, like every uh, Jewish boy's uh, parents, my dad obviously wanted me to be a doctor. Um, he also <laughs> wanted my brother to be a doctor. Neither of us are. Um, I think when I got grade nine in my chemistry O level, I probably realised I wasn't ever going to uh, be a scientist, uh, which uh, you have to be to start medical medical school. I um, I had the choice of that or the other side of the family the show business side and i i chose the show business side much to uh my father's uh disapproval at the time although he was supportive later on when he saw that i was pretty good at what i did he was very supportive but he obviously wanted uh, someone to carry on the family he was a gp in twickenham he wanted someone to take on the practice you know when he retired and so on um but it was not to be. I, I I veered towards entertainment. I wanted to be on the stage. I wanted to be an entertainer myself, a comedian. Uh, but again, um, it was sort of frowned upon that you were a that <laughs> thought you would be a performer. My uncle Bernie Delfon always said, uh, "Don't be a turn." He used to call them turns. He said, "Don't be a turn." He said, "Be the one that takes the ten percent from the turns." He said, "It's much better and easier." And was he right? Oh yeah. <laughs> when I see some of my friends who are entertainers, some quite big names, and the stress uh, and and uh, difficult times that some of them have been through uh, to achieve success and um, not always retained success, it's it, it's not a life that I would have chosen for myself. I think I made the right decision. And and did you? To what degree did you uh, talk to and? Uh... Uh, if you like engage with your uncles in terms of what you were doing was it was it very much a, a you know standoffish scenario or were you under their wing in some way well i was under their wing particularly bernie delphon i was under their wing uh mostly as as bernie always said he always believed that nepotism begins at home so uh he... I, like, I love that's a great <laughs> quote i'm taking that one Sorry, and I'm taking that one. <laughs> You're welcome to it. <laughs> he was glad to get rid of it. Um, I, 
yes, under their wing, definitely. I mean, they were the sort of people that would give you the break, would give you the intro, and then it was down to you to prove yourself. And woe betide you if you if you screwed up, you know. I mean, we had to, I had to work my butt off to be uh, to justify their belief in me. And also, of course, you're constantly being compared to them by by your by your peers and by people you're working for and with who, you know, either, oh, he'll never be as good as his uncle or, um, oh, well, he's just no good anyway. You know, um, they must be ashamed of him. So, you know, you can't win one way or the other. All you could do is work hard and build relationships and uh, think carefully about what you do. And in the end, you know, I found my niche in marketing and advertising initially, initially in the in the movie business after I was an agent, trained as an agent, uh, and then um, you know stayed in that field in public relations, you know, in marketing um, until I retired uh, about ten years ago. You know, I, I talk. I'm a business consultant by trade, as they say, and I talk a lot to clients about the importance of motivation in any yeah. setting up a business or even, of course, growing a business. Was it an added motivation, in essence, that feeling of, I suppose, two things. Number one, you didn't want to let them down. And and I guess number two, you didn't want people saying, oh, it's all right for Ian because he's got Uncle Lou and Uncle Bernie. Was that an added motivation to make sure it, it works and go the extra mile? Absolutely, completely. I mean, it, it made me determined that I was going to prove my own worth and not just ride along on their on their bootstraps, you know, that, that no, so no one could actually say, well, you know, he's only here because of his uncle. They might say, well, he got the job because of his uncle, but then it was down to me to prove myself because it was always made clear to me by, by Bernie Delphon and, and Lou and anybody else I worked who helped me that the minute I screwed up, I'd be straight out the door on, on my ass. And that was it. Yeah, and that's a massive so, motivation to work. Oh, absolutely. Work hard, and isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Once you're sacked by one of the grades, you ain't going to work anywhere else. No, no, that's <laughs> that's absolutely right. Yeah, nowhere to hide, as they say. I think that's, that's what right. springs to mind. Nowhere there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you've obviously done an awful lot uh, in the show business arena. Um, when you look back, are there any particular elements of it or any particular parts of the jobs that you were doing that you look back on and think, that was I was most happy when I was doing that or were they all amazing they were all good but I mean if you look back at certain aspects of the job I think I was probably happiest when I was running um, uh, marketing as it would be called now advertising and publicity as it was called then for um, CIC UK, which was Paramount, Universal, and MGM Pictures distributors in the UK, and uh, and I was, I think, at my happiest then, uh, working with artists, which is something you know, with film actors and actresses, prom you know, on promotion, which of course I was good at working with talent because I'd been an agent, so I could I could talk to them on their own level. All right maybe it was a little bit different dealing with uh dealing with roy castle and dealing with charlton heston but <laughs> but um, <laughs> it gave me a sort of an insight into into how to deal with talent and i think uh, and working on marketing and advertising and budgeting for films and seeing a successful movies released here i worked on saturday night fever greece um dozens of, of huge films over here and I was, that was I think when I was at my happiest uh, I was very young then in my sort of late 20s um, so uh, I was I was happy that I was given the responsibility to do it and I learned a lot at that time I had some great people working with me as well which was important Ian there must be a fantastic book in there somewhere <sighs> God, there is, but only I've got to wait till look. I've got to wait till a lot of people die before I can do it, <laughs> or change the names. As I've said it to a few people, say, change the names to, to to protect the guilty. Yeah, I think the happiest yeah. time was when I was with after I left uh, uh, CIC. I went to work for EMI Films. Uh, we were producing films at that time, and and I think the happy uh, uh, the thing I always remember about that was touring doing a nine-week promotional tour of Europe and South America with village people. 
Um, that certainly was an eye opener for me. <laughs> it was in 1980. We were promoting a film called Can't Stop the Music or Can't Stand the Music, as it was later known. Um, but uh, we had a really good time. I mean, those were the sort of things I really enjoyed doing. And then later on, I had 14 years at First Leisure Corporation where I was working on on corporate relations and uh, marketing for nightclubs, uh, bars, temping bowling centers, theaters, and so on. So it was, you know, I've had a diverse career, but it's all been in that same little sort of entertainment niche, out of home leisure, if you like. Yeah, of course. I mean, just, that is just amazing. The, the, the range. Of, and as somebody like myself, who's uh, very much driven by variety in my work, get bored easy, another yeah. way of putting it. <laughs> I absolutely love that idea of all these different elements of, uh, of, of the entertainment industry that you've been involved in and the depth as well as breadth of that. I just think it's yeah. amazing. And the synergies between all of them, even though you think might think that advertising a movie is different to advertising a can of baked beans actually they're both exactly the same just just different products um and the you know if you can do one thing in the entertainment business you can probably do three or four different things because they're all related and they're interrelated leisure entertainment theater show business um working with talent you know working you know artist management it's all I worked with some wonderful artists when I started when I was 19, 20. I worked with brilliant people at London Management, people like Lonnie Donegan and uh, Roy Castle and Des O'Connor and Morgan Wise, of course, people that we handled in the agency. And it was, you know, a great uh, grounding, but it was hard work. You know. Well, what would you say was the, the hardest bit of it? Um, I mean, you know, was it about getting people, rec you know, people maybe in their relatively early careers? Was it about getting them to be chosen, if you like, for parts or for, for shows? Yeah. Or was that one of the hardest bits? Or was it was it was it like herding cats when it comes of, to <laughs> entertainment people because they're all being, nuts? <laughs> the hardest part of being an agent is always is always um, indicating new you know finding new talent and then getting them seen and getting them noticed um, when i was at london management it was a lot easier at the agency because we were handling some of the biggest names in variety at the time you know morgan wise Des O'Connor, les dawson people like that and it was easier uh, to say to a tv producer or to someone who was you know, who was booking more and wise from us, say, we want you to have a look at this, this boy singer, we think he's great, you know, and that, that was, that was slightly easier when I, uh, you know, when you, when you, when you're on your own, and you're, you don't handle any big stars, but you're trying to get new talent seen. In those days, it was really very, diff very difficult. It's harder now, because there's fewer places for them to work. Obviously, in the, in, you know, in, in past times, acts would work in social clubs in clubs in north working men's clubs and so on that market is completely gone now so you've got nowhere to place your artists you know you, you could get them solid you know 50 weeks work a year if they were if they were good in the clubs and when they were working in clubs you could get tv producers and other people down to see them to see them work but of course that market is completely gone now um so yes it, it that's the hardest part of, the, of that particular job yeah yeah that's fascinating so on on the on the movie side on the film side was there a formula that um you tended to follow that gave you i won't say guaranteed success but you pretty much knew that formula or that advertising strategy and approach would probably work with the right acts was 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 there a formula because i'm thinking about the the internet and the impact the internet's had, which is a conversation in itself, really. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm in marketing myself as a, as a business consultant, and it's constantly looking, you have to be the most creative person in the world, if, even if you're running a plumbing business in Bolton, yeah. you know, because to cut through the noise and to be seen and heard with so much competition for that attention, was there a, see what i'm saying was there a formula that you could follow back in the day before the internet that you pretty much knew would probably work or not 
You mean in the film business? Yeah, sorry, in the, the movies, yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, to market movies. Absolutely, yes, there was a formula. But, of course, we were we were at the forefront, uh, you know, in the sort of mid to late 70s. We were in the forefront of revolutionising film marketing because in, in previous days, you know, you marketed a film by taking a couple of ads in the local paper and sticking a few posters up in the street things uh, moved on we we uh, pioneered the use of radio advertising for uh for movies particularly with capital radio in london uh which of course was a new thing commercial radio and and they embraced movies and movies embraced commercial radio because the the target markets were the same young young adults um we also did um started doing ourselves and other film companies started doing television advertising for films which had never been ever considered because it wasn't thought to be uh, viable financially but we made it viable financially uh, and working with record companies to promote movies like uh, Saturday Night Fever where you've got um, I mean the day uh, the day that Greece opened um, the um, the theme tune was number one in the charts. We'd worked with record companies and to um, to well, to revel. It's a bit of a, a thing to say. We revolutionised uh, film marketing, but I feel we did. You know, it was previously it was a very insular sort of business, the film business, and it was all very localised and and uh, parochial. But we we made a lot of changes. Me and and people at my time uh in the business so uh, yeah there was a formula to go back to the original question there was a there was a formula but we were constantly hitting the formula on the head and trying to dig around and see how how it could be changed and maximized and of course saturday night fever made the Bee Gees, didn't it i saw something on the tv the other night that was when they really cut through wasn't it yeah it was their second time yeah they'd been they'd been hugely successful previously with songs like massachusetts and uh, uh say by the bell and those but um they'd had a very quiet period their career had sort of plateaued and then and then gone down and uh robert stigwood uh producer of uh, of uh, was producing saturday night fever um and also looked after the beaches um got them to write some songs for the film and the rest is the rest is history and saturday night fever is not a musical it's a it's a it's a, a drama with a with a brilliant soundtrack um and uh yeah i mean i worked alongside the Bee Gees management uh we all worked together on promoting that film uh which had already been a huge success in america so we had part of the job done for us but uh you know we we um we made sure that we worked so closely that the, there was almost uh there was no way of separating the film the music uh the soundtrack it was all marketed as a joint um package if you like so in order coming I mean, you had amazing success and as i said I'm, i wasn't kidding when i said there's a book there I would, I'd, I'd buy that yeah. in, a, in a nanosecond i can tell you now i know i know what i like and all that unfortunately that there's been lots of books about the family and i think i don't think there's room for any more to be honest well you know you've inspired me to dig a few out now i'm, I'm really interested to, <laughs> to 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 find out more about uh lou and bernie and what have you um so uh, obviously the the internet came along i guess you were still involved uh, in 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 the what you were doing when the internet came along how did that start to change things do, do you recall a moment when well, you thought oh my god this is big or was it <laughs> gradual by the time the internet came along we were i was in um uh, working for first edge corporation as uh, looking after corporate relations uh, and uh, public relations as well whatever you want to call it press media relations so um it wasn't so crucial then for us um because we were people were going to nightclubs going to bars going to tempin bowling uh centers and health and fitness clubs as they still are not as we speak but as they as they still are in yeah. general yeah. so really it didn't impact on us that much it did um it did help us certainly in the nightclub business in as much as it made it, it made it simple for people to book uh, a table at one of the clubs or to uh, 
uh, for us to promote uh, the businesses, promote the individual clubs in their local areas using uh, local newspaper websites or uh, local sort of news aggregators in each town we were all over the uk at that time so um it didn't impact on us i think i think probably more had i still been in the film business i'd have been looking uh, a little bit more carefully at uh, at how it impacted and we know we now know the success of streaming and uh, how you can make money uh, from the internet because of course in the early days the net everything was free anyway so uh, but yes, I, uh, it didn't really impact on the business I was in at that time. On the entertainment business in general, yes, I think it did because a lot of stuff was available uh, online. And um, as a friend of mine in the film business used to say, uh, he said, you can now watch brand new movies in the piracy of your own home. So <laughs> Another good line. That's the second <laughs> great line I've had from you today. Ian. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I mean, it's... Yeah. Well, we all know the, the value it's brought to our lives. I mean, where would we have been in this current situation without the internet? Yeah, I wouldn't be talking to you now. No, 100%. Um, so maybe it would have been good. Yeah, 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 exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, what strikes me, talking to you and listening to your career, is is it is it a fair observation to say that you must have had to have a certain passion for people to do what you did as a Absolutely. as well as the as, as well as the business absolutely 100 yeah. percent. there's no way i could have done what i've done in my career if i hadn't uh, been good with people enjoyed working with people all different sorts of people uh there's no way i could have done it uh without that this is absolutely essential i'm glad you've picked up on that point uh because i probably wouldn't have wouldn't have picked up on it, it it's so true absolutely it's essential and you know i am a sort of people person you can tell i'm quite sort of you know out there and you know i like to talk particularly about myself uh but <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, it's essential. It was essential. And, you know, I'm still now, you know, now I'm retired and I'm working, you know, doing quite a bit of stuff in the charity sector. Uh, again, those those uh, people skill, interpersonal skills, if you like, are, are vital, absolutely vital. Yeah. And, and of course, nowadays, um, apart from obviously the, 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 the personal, what you might call what what is was the face to face scenario. Is it fair to say as well that nowadays with, um, you know, you've obviously heard of influencers and it's also the ability to be able to connect and engage with people through a screen, not necessarily yeah. just engage with people physically together. Absolutely. And it's it's very difficult to engage through a screen because you can't gauge uh, body language, particularly through a screen. I mean... I'm conscious of the fact that I'm talking to you and while I'm talking, you're nodding to show that you're listening and that you understand what I'm talking about. When you talk, I do the same. It's uh, standard news, news reporter, news interviewer technique, the noddy shots, you know, where they nod as though they're even in the slightest bit interested in what the interviewee is saying. But online, it's very difficult because we're head and shoulders, as most people are mm. uh, now when they're online. You haven't got the full body to, to like, use your hands. I mean, I'm conscious of the fact that I'm waving my hands around here and all it's doing is putting a shadow on my face. So <laughs> try and bring them up where you can. Yeah, uh, it, yeah I, it, it's it's much it's really important now where so much is conducted so much business is conducted online now and as we're doing now and i think that's going to continue i mean even when um even when this god-awful situation is all over which it hopefully will be um sooner rather than later i think there's going to be a lot more people working from home continuing to do what they're doing now you don't necessarily need to get on an aeroplane and spend five thousand pounds on a first class fare to new york to go and have a meeting with uh, someone uh and the carbon footprint that uh, that that creates you can do it as we're doing it now online uh but you do have to be yes you have to be able to express yourself in in words rather than in in actions 
Yeah, um, it's interesting you should say that because um, I've never been on a, I've never been on an interviewing course. I've learned it through experience. I've probably done about six hundred. But the truth is why I do channels like this and I, I set up an online business TV channel back in the early 2000s and that's uh -huh. where it, that's where the journey started mm -hmm. and uh, before YouTube, etc. Um, and um, the truth is I'm just absolutely genuinely interested in people's stories. <laughs> so when I'm nodding, I'm actually nodding because I'm interested in what you're saying. I, I don't know where it comes from. My wife says you must be a nosy sod. Personally, I'd like to say it's curious. <laughs> It's probably a bit it's, of both. Yeah, it's curiosity. I mean, I'm the same as you. I'm, I'm fascinated by people's lives and what they've done in their lives. And um, yeah, it is. Um, it's curiosity. It's also an element of nosiness, I expect. But it's also a good way of thinking, hearing someone who's done something and you think, oh, that's quite a good idea. Maybe I should think about doing something like that or maybe or I wish I'd wish I'd done something like that. Um, you know, you can it's sort of self-education as well as nosiness and uh, and and just interest. You know, you can you can learn a lot. I mean, you know, we start off learning from other people when we're in school. We can continue to learn from other people all our lives, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And that's really what the at the heart of it, that's what this channel's all about. I call it the four eyes, you know, insight, ideas, information, and inspiration. And if somebody can get one of those things, I think the yeah. the um what's wonderful for me, and it happened when I did the experts online TV channel, is when somebody sends an email or somebody sends you a text or a message or whatever these days and says, I watched that interview and it made me think, and as a result, I did this, I changed yeah. life's direction. Yeah, it you gives know, you a nice feeling inside, feeling. doesn't it? Yeah. Gives you a nice feeling inside when you know that you've made or help to make a difference to someone's life. I think that's really important. And I mean, in the charity work I do with the Royal Variety Charity, which you know we'll probably talk about in a minute, uh, making a difference to people's lives is is just so important and so rewarding. It just makes it all worthwhile, to be honest. Oh yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm glad you raised that because you, you may or may not be aware, but um, we got to do an interview with Giles. Uh, yeah, Giles Cooper, true. yeah, yeah, uh, fantastic interview. Obviously, a wonderful fella. Um, yeah. So, tell me about how you got involved in the Royal Variety and 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 how that's how that's developed over the years. Yeah, I mean, it was before uh, before Giles's day. Giles, our chairman of the charity, fantastic, loads of experience in the music business, having been uh, at the sharp end at uh, uh, music magazines a lot of his life, and and now promoting gigs um how i got involved well um the charity was originally uh, when i joined it was called the entertainment artist benevolent fund the eabf and my uncle bernard delfont had been instrumental in revitalizing the charity uh, back in the 50s and early 60s um the the charity's main asset is we own a care home for elderly entertainers in twickenham in uh in West London, and um, the, the home had been very successful and sort of moving along quite nicely. Uh, Bernie sort of revitalized the charity and put a little bit more oomph into it. Um, and I joined the charity's committee um, sometime after my uncle died. Um, I'm just trying to remember when I did join the committee. I think it was in the sort of 2005 or something like that. And um, I'm now uh, the treasurer, uh, the honorary treasurer and a trustee of the charity. And we still have our wonderful care home, Brinsworth House in Twickenham, uh, where we look after 36 uh, members of the former members of the profession of the entertainment business and we also support um, several others in their own homes by providing them with grants uh, and uh, any, anything they need if they they need food or they need a new boiler or they need something we can look after that and we do this we make our uh, main income from staging the royal variety performance every year um, which uh, is uh, uh, seen in 40 countries around the world uh, on TV. We're in partnership with ITV, 
uh, who are our broadcast partners on the show. And uh, it's it's a wonderful charity to be involved with. Plus, there's the family connection, the fact that my uncle, my family were always involved with it, and the sense, the rewarding sense of knowing that you're that you're looking after people and uh, doing a doing you know ma making what you're doing worthwhile. You know, rather than just being retired and sitting around gardening and uh, and watching TV. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, last year, as it is now, I was doing this at the start of 2021. Uh, last year, you went virtual with it uh, from Blackpool. Yeah, we were in uh, Blackpool where I, I, with First Leisure, when, when I'd been with First Leisure Corporation, uh, we owned uh, Blackpool Tower, all three piers, the Winter Gardens. So I knew the town very well. And we were uh, lucky enough to be able to stage the Royal Variety Show uh, in 2020 in Blackpool in front of a virtual audience because we weren't permitted an audience, of course. Uh, the show was on a much smaller scale. It was uh, because obviously we couldn't have any American artists. No one could, could come over or fly in. And we had an absolutely brilliant show, which uh, uh, was hosted by Jason Manford, who was just superb. And we had some wonderful artists. Uh, it was a great show. Everyone really enjoyed it. And uh, shown on TV later by uh, by ITV, but we did have a virtual audience on the night. We put um, ITV had put um, uh, monitors, TV monitors, on a load of seats in the stalls of the theatre. <laughs> the Creativity at its best. <laughs> it was yeah, it was great. It looked like Dixon's window, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. uh, so at least the artists had someone to work to, because particularly for a comedian, it's you know working to an empty theatre is soul destroying uh but it worked so well and it was so popular one of the most popular shows we've done the the uh, plaudits we received and the and the kind words we had from everyone who saw it was just fantastic it was a wonderful show wonderful yeah yeah i mean i i, I was really impressed with it and uh I, obviously i was i was aware of what was going on through uh the co-founder of of um passion spencer phillips who i know spencer, like, you know yeah. You know very well yeah and uh so i saw everything that was that was going on behind the scenes and he t messaged me a couple of times uh, during the show so and it was great i, w I managed to w get to watch it and it was uh, it was really yeah. fantastic yeah and i guess i yeah. guess it always it always helps as well like you say giving something back and making a difference to, to people's lives yeah. yeah yeah i mean obviously uh you know it's our main fundraising event every year and and running a care home is is an expensive operation uh, you know, we, we have a lot of staff and, uh, you know, our payroll bill is huge. Uh, and obviously this year, without a paying audience, we, we you know, we had to uh, uh, cut our uh, uh, suit according to our cloth. But uh, to be able to stage a show at all was an achievement this year. Uh, but there was really never a question that we wouldn't. It's an annual tradition. Obviously, um, there was no royal in attendance this year, but we had a wonderful video message from uh, the Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, uh, who was gave us a fantastic uh, message, which was shown on the night uh, and on the TV broadcast. And the whole show was just, everyone was just so joyful. Uh, and we were also thrilled, of course, that we could have uh, uh, Sir Tom Moore, Captain Sir Tom on the, uh, at the end of the show doing his we'll never walk alone uh virtually with uh, michael ball which was just wonderful great finale and you know great finale to this interview as well what a, we, we didn't plan it at all what did we and yet nope. we got to you know captain tom moore mentioned on just yes. the day after he's passed away we couldn't have planned that moore, better ian captain tom moore and the village people in the same interview <laughs> The, the word that springs to mind, Ian, is eclectic. That's the word that springs to mind. <laughs> right, well, thanks very much for joining me today, Ian. It's been an absolute joy, and I'm not just saying that. That's not a trained journalist spiel. Uh, it's been an absolute joy talking to you, really fascinating. And uh, as I say, when that book comes out, um, I'll be straight on to Amazon <laughs> to put my order in. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Phil. It's been an absolute pleasure being with you thank you so much and when that book comes out be careful because you might be in it oh well well that I'll, that I'll take that depending upon the way i'm in it <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much ian
Okay, thanks. All the best. Cheers. Bye. Bye.